started as an official of the European Commission in Luxembourg in 1995. And in 1999, there was a big scandal in Europe, which was called, uh, was launched by a whistleblower called Paul von Beutelin. And he revealed that um, the uh, European Commission was, uh, or some people in, within the European Commission, especially Edith Cresson, had some kind of fraternity bounds and some, some illegal uh, handling of contracts, uh, giving uh, benefits to people who should have received them. And this led to a suspension of the whistleblower first and afterwards to a report of the, of the wise man commission of the European Parliament, which found that um, there was nobody resp feeling responsible within the, in the European Commission. And this was the main statement in that report, and it led to uh, the resignation of the Santa Commission. So there was an, uh, an impeachment procedure launched in the European Parliament, and while it, uh, the procedure was still pending, uh, the, the Commission declared to step down. And after that, uh, Mr. Prodi came into office as uh, President of the Commission, and they declared a zero tolerance policy against corruption and uh, replaced the old uh, commission internal uh, department called OCLAF uh, by a new department called OLAF, which was claimed to be independent. And OLAF stands for Organisation Lut anti fraud which is uh, anti-corruption office of the uh, institutions. Yeah, and there's the problem already that uh, OLAF has some kind of Twitter stack, uh, uh, bisexual status, so to say, uh, because on one hand it should be independent and be responsible for independent control of European institutions, including the European Commission. And on the other hand, the uh, chairman of uh, OLAF, or the director general of OLAF, is just a normal director general of the Commission as any other director general of the Commission. And he's bound uh, to uh, loyalty duties to the Commission and he's, he's getting, getting his budget as part of the commission budget and he spends a lot of money himself for anti-corruption measures and for his own department. Um, so uh, there is some kind of links and in my case these links may have played a certain role. Uh, so I, I said this because it's important to know that there was a big uh, whistleblower scandal in, in the European Commission. The whistleblower wasn't protected well. There was a corruption issue and, and, and when I started uh, or before my, my case started, there was a so-called zero tolerance policy against corruption. So that was the second, there was OLAF. And my case started uh, with my work, which meant that uh, I was responsible for a project called uh, Legal Consolidation, CONSLEC. And the aim of this project was to, to republish all texts of the European law, which have ever been amended, changed in, in, into one uh, text. So we, we included the amendments into the text and republished the text so that you have a complete text as it is enforced at a given date um, to consult only one text instead of 10, 15 different journals, uh, official journals, and to put the text together uh, yourself. So you could call it a transparency project. Uh, to ease uh, access to European law for, for citizens. And in the beginning, this, this project was done by, as a small project uh, with in-house staff, and then later on it was decided to have this project enlarged and to have uh, all texts consolidated till the accession of the Eastern uh, European states. So that was in 2004 or five when, when the, the Eastern States access to the European, uh, European Union. And uh, the aim was to have all texts ready at that time. So there was a certain uh, promise and a certain uh, delay. And there was a call for tender made to uh, get external uh, firms doing the job and thus to uh, be able to handle this massive amount of workload. And we are talking about, at that time, 11 different languages all official languages of the European Union. And we're talking about uh, 2,000 legal acts which have been modified by roughly four uh, or three or four um, modifications in each case. And the aim was to, to, to finalize that quite quickly. 
So there was a call for tender made. Before that, there was a budget uh, as, uh, assigned to this to this project, and then the call for tender ended with a, with a firm, uh, or was won by a firm who who had a very uh, competitive offer, so very cheap price. And what what happened then was that instead of having the the, the workload ready and the the, the, uh, the, the uh, deliveries ready that have been agreed in the contract, so they have a fixed amount of uh, roughly 10,000 pages a week, which they should have produced within these 11 languages. And um, they should have been able to, to produce and deliver that workload in the, in the correct form and in, in good quality um, after three months after the contract. And they, they weren't able to do that. And then uh, there were some kind of negotiations and we gave them some extra delays and then they, they started discussing uh, the, the call for tender, if the description of the work was correct and all these things, and then there was a, an agreement in, in May 2001 uh, in which my bosses and their bosses agreed uh, on the interpretation of certain clauses of the contract. But still after that, they weren't able to produce the quality and, and, and the, the quantity and uh, within time the delays which were fixed in the contract. And normally the contract for that case had uh, penalty clauses foreseen, and uh, what happened was that nothing happened. So never ever with any of these penalty clauses smuggled the project executed, despite me asking for, for these penalties to be executed. And instead of executing the penalties, what happened was what I would call some kind of blackmail by the by that firm. So they told my bosses, uh, that they either should give them more money or that the project would fail, which would mean that, that they would be uh, politically responsible for not being able to, to steer the, the project. And the next step was then that I was notified that there was a new contract. So they renegotiated the contract, which according to the firm uh, led to a 14% decrease of costs and according to a calculation of one of my staff members to a, to a 58% decrease, uh, increase of cost. So what they did, there was a fixed price uh, in, in the contract, but this fixed price was as a, as a cutoff price. So instead, uh, normally the, the cost of the contracts were calculated by, by a very uh, detailed price schedule. So we have 20 different or even more different types of work and each of these works has a price. But instead of, and, and in addition to this detailed price schedule, there was a, a maximum price per page. And uh, this maximum price per page was with its new contract uh, taken as the only price. While before, uh, it was a cover price. So for me, it's not like quite clear how that could lead to any decrease. Um, and I uh, thought that this was uh, a bit mysterious, or even more. And I um, had an obligation within being an EU official to notify any financial, possible financial irregularities, uh, either to my superiors, which were the ones involved, or to Olaf. So what I did, after some, some time of thinking about it, was to inform Olaf about what I saw. And giving them uh, a lot of details and uh, Olaf is the, uh, the anti-fraud office of the European Commission. And um, so I sent it to them and afterwards I was interviewed by Olaf and uh, when I got a transcript of that interview I didn't realize that it was the interview they took with me. So I gave them some corrections to the interview and then I, for a long time, I haven't heard anything from Olaf. And finally, after 18 months, Olaf took the decision that uh, the case was closed without further. And they made an 11 page final case report. And in this final case report, uh, you won't find any legal harm. So, for me, as a jurist, that was quite suspicious because normally you would expect that you have an allegation and you have a legal norm which could have been violated and then you test the facts if they lead to a violation of this legal norm. That's what it was. 
fraud and, and uh, testing fraud is all about. And the other thing which you couldn't find in the final case report was financial field. So you could argue, okay, in case A, we have uh, paid X, and in, in case B, uh, if that would have not happened, we have paid Y. And then you could compare the figures and, and calculate from the figures that there wasn't any damage, and, and then the case, then you might be able to close the case. Uh, but as I said, no, no legal norm, no figures. Instead, you only find a statement that, yeah, uh, everything I said was right, but my bosses have been in a difficult situation, and they're in that difficult situation, their behavior was understandable. That's all you find in this case, And it reveals also that Olaf didn't look into any, in, into any invoices, and into any details of, of, the, of the contract. They only looked into the contract and they only had one interview with me, despite me uh, telling them that they should have interviewed the, the guy who calculated these figures, for example. Uh, so I wasn't too happy with that report. And then I decided that uh, if I have an obligation to notify this to Olaf, then Olaf should have an obligation to make a proper investigation. Uh, and, and especially as there is some notion in the in the uh, statute of officials which uh, indicates that the uh, commission should have taken appropriate measures. And I think an investigation like that, I would call it an appropriate measure. So I went to the court, and the court told me, uh, the European court, general court now, uh, told me that uh, I have no standing. Uh, so my case was found to be invisible. So they didn't look into the case. Essentially, that's what invisibility means. But at the same time, they made a little dictum saying that uh, Olaf did everything. Then I, I, went, I, I went to an appeal to that case to the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice confirmed it. So the case was closed. Um, and the case which is mentioned in the, in the description of that talk is a, is a kind of follow-up to that one. So because I was found not to be able to, to attack <coughs> legally the decision of Olaf to close the case, I decided, so what other ways do I have? And the only way I found after informing all internal uh, organizations in the European Union, which you can imagine, uh, so I, I wrote to the President of the European Parliament, to the President of the Council, to the President of the, of the uh, Court of Audits, to, to the Ombudsman, and none of them was able or willing to, to, to question Olaf's case, and, and Olaf's case handling. And so uh, I thought the only way of, of dealing with the story, which to my calculations led to, to, to the deficit uh, of the EU, of at least formerly in Europe, uh, was to, to, to make it public. But as a European official, I'm not allowed to make it public. I'm bound to, uh, to secrecy. So, um, but it says in, in the statute that uh, whenever I want to publish, I, I'm not allowed to publish anything without uh, allowance, no, not allowance. Without consent uh, from, from my private so I, I asked to get, I, I burned this, this data and, and the documents related to this case onto a CD-ROM. And I sent that CD-ROM to, uh, to my superiors or to the, to the European Commission, asking them to consent that I could publish this and that I could give it to national prosecutors. And what happened then was that the European Commission told me, oh, these are far too many documents. And uh, you should at least uh, give, give a, uh, make an overview table uh, showing which, which documents are on that. So okay, I thought, why not? I, I made this table. But then uh, they still afterwards decided that my uh, request was unspecific, which is something which I still can't understand. But in the end, uh, I went to court, getting uh, <coughs> this decision that it was uh, specific and not. 
And the courts found, uh, once again, two courts, that uh, yeah, the commission was right, and this, this request was unspecific. So in the end, uh, yeah, I didn't get that com uh, confirmation or uh, possibility to, to handle these documents, and, and this case is closed now as well. What does that mean in this case? Then you can't ask me, then you better ask the, the, the European courts. I thought there were another identification that was ready for that specific reason. Now the, the court said the court said something more than the commission, because the commission just wanted a table which I handed in, so that in my understanding, uh, I fulfilled all the requirements of the court, but then the court just invented new. So in, in, the, in the statute, there isn't anything about it, it's just saying we need a, we need a consent. And uh, they said then, yeah, but to be specific, such a, a request would have needed to have for each single document a summary, an explanation what's the document about, and for each document, the reason why I want to publish it, how I want to publish it, and what does it show, and why, and, and all the details. How many documents are talking about? 200, approximately. But this was, this was said by the court retrospectively. Nobody could have known uh, at that time that the court would um, give this requirement. There's, there's no base in law or in any regulation for that. They just derived it from general reasons of, of specific quality of requests. So. Um, yeah, but this is only the, the tip of the iceberg, and for me the most severe case. And it's, it's severe because there were a lot of other things happening in that case. And a lot of lessons we learned, uh, the two of us, during this uh, handling with the EU court. And in total, I've got 25, uh, approximately 25 uh, cases before the European courts because I also got problems with my uh, notation and with my career uh, decisions taken on me. Uh, and uh, there was other issues I wasn't allowed to get access to my own file. And um, there were disputes about that. And there as well, they turned it down as inadmissible in the end because uh, you need to have a two-step procedure, and they found that I only expect one step of this procedure. So what, I, what I'm essentially now trying to, to point out is uh, answering the question, or I, I won't answer the question. I leave it to you that to answer the question. But the question which I would like to pose is: uh, Is the um, the setting and the rules of procedure and the handling of the rules of procedure in EU staff cases before the EU courts fair in the sense of Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the European Charter of Human Rights. So is, this, is it a fair process? Do you have a balance of um, equality of arms? That's a question which I would like you to to, to answer, and I give you some, some arguments which might help you to find that answer. So it's clear that Article 6, uh, Paragraph 1 of the uh, Charter of Human Rights sets up this criteria. And uh, so what does equality of arms mean? There was a, was a statement which I quoted in one of the cases as well from, from a former high-ranking judge in the UN, dealing with UN staff cases, and he said that uh, it's not sufficient that there is a formal balance because you need to take into account the factual situation. And the, fa in a, the factual situation is that as a member of staff going against your own bosses and your own institution, you're already in a situation which puts you in, 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 a, in a very difficult situation where, where there is no equality of powers and equality of arms. So what, what a, a real judicial system would need to do, according to his words, very general, is to, to somehow give advantages or somehow try to, to, to rebalance this, this balance that um, 
giving some, some kind of substitution for this, for this uh, difference of power between the two waves, between, between the two parties. So uh, trying to answer the question which I posed, you might want to take this aspect, general setting, into account. So now looking at the EU staff cases, what's the situation? The situation is that according to Article 90, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 2 of the staff regulations, you need to, before you, be, before you are able to go to court, you need to follow a pre-procedure, an administrative pre-procedure. And this pre-procedure means that you first, if you want something from, from your bosses, you first need to request them. And to give them time to answer your request, and after your request has either been turned down or not answered within, I think it's three or four months, um, then you need to make a complaint against turning down. That's the second step of the procedure, against turning down the uh, decision or your request or against uh, the non-reaction to that uh, request. And in one of my cases, for example, we had the problem exactly about that, and the case was found inadmissible because they said the letter which I got from the commission wasn't an answer, so it wasn't a no, and I should have respected, uh, waited for the time to be, uh, de uh, the, 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 the delay to be finished before going to court while I interpreted the, the answer which I got from the commission as a denial. And uh, so that they, they, they found to be uh, relevant and they, they completely ignored the fact that I never got any other reply from the commission. So it was just a, time, a matter of time which was for them sufficient to turn the case down. Another problem is that uh, there's some kind of preclusion. So this means that any argument which you want to raise in front of the court, you also you already need to raise in that pre-procedure. So any argument which you didn't raise in the pre-procedure is, is dead. You can't raise it any later. And that's a general principle of these courts as well, that it's not the, the judge knowing the, uh, the law. So it's not like in a normal court where you present the facts and the judge knows the law and applies it. No, you are obliged to give the judge the reasoning why and how the law should be applied. If you don't raise a, a, a specific uh, legal norm, the court won't look at it, at least not in your favor. They would look for any case, any reasons of admissibility, so there the judge will, will investigate as much as they want to see that your case is not admissible, but in, 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 the, in the merits of the case, it's for you to bring any argument, and which, if you don't bring the argument, or if you didn't bring it in the pre-procedure, it's excluded. So this is just principle, or is it by law? No, this is just... Uh, it's, it's done like this. It's done like this, it has always been done like this, it's not written down anywhere. Um, you have also different delays, so the staff member must react within three months, the institution has four months in this pre-procedure. And then there is a so-called clause, which is that you can only go to court against an act adversely affecting you. And this is very narrowly interpreted, interpreted by the court. So for example, in one of my cases, I said uh, that this, or in the one which I, which, I, which I explained to you, that this Olaf decision lead to my sick, led to my sickness. So the, the, the decision which I attacked was one contributing factor to me being now unfit for work, which is uh, a depression. <laughs> and the commission even agreed that this was a contributing factor, so I'm job-relatedly sick, I'm job-relatedly job unfit to work. But when I raised that argument to the court that it's an, uh, a violation of my right to health done by this decision, the court found that even this violation of my health, or that this is irrelevant and not a contributing factor for uh, allowing me to go to court. In a very recent decision of someone else where he uh, was representing uh, uh, another client. Um, I just thought, it's not uh, Mr. Strack, but uh, with another client, I got a, um, a judgment of 
the, the court. Um, the, the civil service tribunal, which is the court of entrance for any um, actions against, against uh, European institutions of, um, of uh, members of these institutions. Uh, we got um, a judgment that our action was inadmissible. Um, in which judgment the court said, yes, um, it's, of course it's possible that uh, human rights are violated, but we cannot, um, we cannot examine this on this level because the action is inadmissible. Because there isn't an act adversely yeah. affecting them. So, so they, they <laughs> very, see very formalistically, so human rights don't count. You can't go to yeah. the court saying, my human rights have been violated, they won't care. That's, that's but they, but, but they, they, in the same time they say, yeah, it's possible that human rights were violated here, but there is no, um, no act which adverts, uh, which um, has a uh, negative effect on the, on the this member or this um, client, and so they they uh, assume okay it's possible to have a human rights violation here, but it's not an act adversely um, affecting, affecting you, you, so you can't raise so, this issue in the court. So it's to me it's completely illogical, mm -hmm. and it's it's all it's all um, to to stop uh, actions to. to, to Lower the number of actions. Now you come on speculating. I, I, I don't want to speculate. Let them answer my question. Okay. I just want to give you facts. So the next yeah. fact: um, in the uh, in, in, in the German legal system, you have uh, different types of actions when you want to go to court. So one is uh, so-called Verpflichtungsklage. It's uh, uh, with of mandatory. I think is the the, the, the English English clause. So you, you can the, the court will take an act for the administration. So you go to court, and in the end you will have an act of the administration issued by the court in a way. So you get what you want. Uh, this is not the case in European law. The only thing you can get is either damages or annulation. So in that case of consent, I can never reach consent given by the court. But the only thing I can reach winning the case, could have reached winning the case, was that the court says that the, the denial of consent by the commission was unlawful. So do I have the consent I need? No, I can't get it. The court system won't ever deliver it. So whatever, whatever would be the result would be that the commission would be forced or would be obliged, to, from a legal point of view, to take a new decision respecting the judgment of the court. So they could always find new reasons for denying the, the concept. For example, in that case, they could have said, uh, okay, in the first round we found it inadmissible, now we, we need to find it admissible, but it doesn't mean that we, we consent to, to giving, uh, to allowing you to, 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 to give out the papers to the media. No, because in that paper we found that problem, in this paper we found that problem, and so on. And then, what, what, what means it, does it mean for you? You need to go to court again. So they are not forced to put their reason up for them. No, they can, they can always, that's another principle, they can always replace their decisions. And they play with that in, 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 in a lot of our cases as well. So you attack one decision, they take another one. So what do you do? Do you attack the new one? Don't you attack the new one? Do you need to attack it in the, in the administrative procedure? Do you need to rerun the administrative re procedure? Do you, can you include it in the court procedure? You never know. And uh, that's how, how we lose case, tend to lose cases or risk to lose cases as well. Another pro a problem of this act adversely affecting uh, you is that you never know which act you can attack. Because uh, there are several situations where you have acts which build on one another. And it's the court in the end who tells you this would have been only a preparatory act, so you can't attack it or this is the act you should have attacked and not only the next, and then the other one is a separate one, so and you didn't attack the basic one, then you, then you can't attack the separate one. So there, there's, there's quite a lot of chances 
to, to lose your case only or already on admissibility, and that's in fact what happens. Most of the staff cases, uh, as far as I know, are lost on inadmissibility. So just for formal reasons? For purely formal, formal reasons. But reasons which even with a lawyer, if he several, several times makes, made two claims, instead of one because just to be sure that you it's it's clear that you will lose one of them but at least you have a chance that one of them is admissible and then you risk to, to that they tell you oh you the, the first case is the only one which is relevant because uh, the other one is uh, least or it was least pendants for the for the next one so it's a pending case on the same issue so you can't raise the second one and the first one isn't admissible and uh, so they, they uh, are quite uh, innovative in finding reasons um, this is speculation. This is my speculation. No, no, I think that you can, you can, there's, you know, which is positive, I mean, isn't it? Okay, but there are some rules. So yeah, the rule is, um, uh, you can only uh, attack an act which is um, adversely affecting you. This is the rule, and that's all. And based on this rule, they make their judgments uh, with a high, very high percentage of in the actions, because so, so this way or the other, they they, uh, they say no, you should not have attacked this uh, this act. You should have attacked another act because this is not the the act really adversely affecting you. Or what what uh, Guido just explained. Yeah? So it's uh, it's written down, yes, but of course this is a few words. You can understand it like like this, like this, like this, like this, and it's case law. So. Uh, so it's always new aspects uh, the courts uh, are, are uh, deliberating and finding um, to make the decision if this was the right act you would attack. So, and how do you access the case law? Next question. The case law, uh, is, or this, the, the final decisions of the, of the courts are normally published, judgments are published, and most of the decisions, oh God, most of the decisions are published. But how are they published? And according to the to the European statute or the, the, the treaty, all languages are equal. So there is no no specific language. All languages should have been equal. And all publications it's written down somewhere that all publications of the courts should be done in all languages. So do they publish the, the, the judgment of staff cases in all languages, as they do for for other cases? They don't. They publish staff cases only in French and in the language of procedure, which in 90% of the cases, approximately 90% of the cases, is also French. So as a German lawyer, uh, you have a choice to, to make the case in German, that's fine, but you can't access the case law, because the case law is only available in French. Is there literature with which, with, with which you could uh, access the case law, or at least know what it is? Yes, there is some literature. And most of the, the, the literature is either from the commission's uh, representatives in court, either from the internal or from, from the external ones. Um, there's even a statement of the German lawyer, a German judge at the uh, at the court of the civil service tribunal, who said that when you hand in in a procedure in another language than French, the annexes which you hand in with your documents are not translated automatically. So they are only translated if the judge wants them to be translated. So how can a judge who doesn't speak the language know if this is relevant in the document which you can't access? For me, that's a, of a difficult question. Anyway, the courts are not very interested in having very long documents. So in, in these courts, you have limitations of your, your, your actions, page limitations, which I have never experienced in any kind of other court, which means that Especially uh, while with a normal action, it's okay with 50 pages. You could, in normal cases, handle it. It's very tri tricky for appeals because for appeals, you have a page limit of 15, one five pages, and one and a half line difference with, uh, with a margin line, which is given. So there's not too much place to express your yourself. And as in that case, which I had, uh, we had one, we had 20, and in the other one, we had 20 reasons of appeal. Uh, it's, it's 
almost impossible to, to, to put that into 15 pages. And that's what we ended up with. So I handed in a document which was 90 pages in one case and 70 in the other. And they, they want, didn't want to accept it. So after three rounds of discussions where they didn't raise any arguments why they won't accept it, um, they in the end accepted it. But in the end, I, got, I became the first person in European law who was, uh, um, I would say, penalized to pay a fee uh, for extra costs. Because they have a clause that when you produce extra costs for the court, uh, you can be made to pay them. So they, they made me pay two, two times 2,000 euro uh, for these two long uh, actions, which are without reasoning why these actions have been too long, because it, it's not a formal barrier where they say actions with more than 15 pages are not accepted or are too long. They just say uh, they shouldn't be longer than normally, but in difficult cases you could have longer. They didn't judge that. And they didn't say which cost they had and, and how much cost they had. No, no, no word about that. Um, yeah, what else could we say? Um, then, in general, when, when the court judges something, uh, when you prove, uh, there is an assumption of correctness of any statement of the institution. So it's always for you to prove that the, the, uh, that the, the statement of the commission was in or the, your, your enemy was, was incorrect. Example here. Yeah. Uh, example for this, I just recently was in an oral hearing also with another uh, another client, and um, we we gave a um, we gave a wording and a, a description of of what happened, uh, which uh, and we we presented or we we offered to to give a witness for this. Um, and it was accusing the, the higher boss of my client in, at that, that case. And, uh, and the witness would have been the, the next boss. So accusing the, the, the second uh, boss in a second uh, superior level and uh, giving uh, as a witness the first boss at the next level and the, the judge said to me in the oral hearing um, about, uh, not the exact wording, but about this, um, wow, this what you what you accuse the, 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 the higher boss of, this is quite serious. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't we have some more proof of that before we hear the witness? <coughs> this is basically what he said to me. So the, the key issue behind that is that the only, in general, the only, the only uh, proof accepted by documents. So they, they normally don't hear witnesses. Uh, there's a, maybe a handful of cases where they ever heard witnesses. And they normally don't, or they never, I, I'm not aware of any case where they uh, have expert witnesses. So the only proof is documents. And who has the documents? You or the institution? Normally it's the institution. And you can't oblige them to get them. I mean, you can. And basically, you have four different legal reasons to, to ask them for documents. But uh, you won't get them in time to win your other case, because you would need to sue them on this. So you would need to sue them for the documents first, and then the delays for the other case would be, would be exempted. And uh, it's absolutely unclear which of these four legal bases you can, you can use, because these four legal bases lead to three different uh, procedural aspects which you need to respect. And uh, at least I got the impression that I was always taught I should have used the other. So you think this is uh, by design or by accident? <laughs> I do it for you to judge that. <laughs> um, I understand that your continuous frustration frustration in try to deal with the, this kind of procedure. And uh, I believe that uh, the answer, the solution, cannot be under kind of procedure, right? So thinking out of the box, it is not possible uh, believe that uh, in order to enhance uh, and uh, speed out uh, the whistleblowing procedure inside of the EUA and start uh, a sort of uh, uh, initiative of anonymous whistleblowing in order to protect uh, with anonymity the source mm -hmm. whistleblower and try to uh, expose uh, the potential wrongdoing outside of the commission. Okay, now, now we are in the, in the, in the 
Edwards area. I will have another talk okay, on whistleblowing at, at, at a quarter to four, so please come to that one and then answer that question there. Okay. Now, I think the question here is not whistleblowing. The question here is, is there a just, a, a just court system within the European Union? If that's the result, whistleblowing, I guess. Whistleblowing can't be a solution. You need to have a court system. And you need to have a court system which is a correct court system. And, and, and you need to have a court system which is under supervision from an external system. So is there supervision from an external body? All member states of the European Union are member states and signatory states of the Council of Europe and the Charter of Human Rights. According to the Lisbon Treaty, the Charter of Human Rights, the European Charter of Human Rights applies for the, for the EU as well. But, and it says the, the Charter of Lisbon from, from, from uh, the Treaty of Lisbon from uh, 2009 also says the European Union should access the, the uh, Charter of Human Rights. Did it access? No, it didn't. They are still negotiating. They don't even have a final draft of the, of the contract. It hasn't been signed and it hasn't been ratified. It needs to be ratified by 47 member states of the Council of Europe and the European institutions. So how long will that take? And meanwhile, what does it mean? You don't have any control by Strasbourg. So there are, there's case law from Strasbourg saying we don't judge about cases of the European Union because we think in general the European Union is a, is a, a respecting the rule of law and has a court system which assures that the rule of law is respected. So they don't even want to have the, um, the, the questions that are posed to you on the table. So, final aspect, so what happens after you won a, court, a case or after you lost a case, there's still an issue which is cost, just to, to round up this thing. Uh, I won cases against the European Commission. I had a lawyer from Luxembourg, so not him, it was one of the first cases I had. This lawyer had invoiced me 36,000 euro. I hadn't had a special contract or agreement with the, with the lawyer about that. He just invoiced me according to Luxembourg law. Luxembourg is the seat of the court. So you should expect that uh, this is respected somehow by the European institutions, in my view. Um, especially as you need someone, a lawyer who is able to speak French, because of the things which I explained before. So what happened? Uh, I, I sent a, a 36,000 euro invoice to the commission because it was all that to pay the cost, because I won the main case. And uh, then the commission said, no, we pay you 8,000 euro. And against that, I, I raised a, a, a cost finding procedure, or cost setting procedure, in, in front of the court. And what did the court say? Oh, yeah, the case is not so complicated. And no, by the way, uh, this Luxembourgish law this doesn't interest us at all. We are Europe. And uh, yeah, we fixed the price by 12,500 euros. So what, winning a case led me to losing 24,000 bucks. Um, losing a case, on the other hand, means uh, that when the commission, which it can, is represented by its own staff, um, you don't need to pay anything or only very minor costs which it efficiently has, so no personal costs. But in uh, some cases nowadays, they employ lawyers, so they take external lawyers. And this external lawyer, in my case and in the case of uh, another plaintiff, started working before he has had a contract which is uh, clearly contrary to specific clause in the European financial regulation. And this other plaintiff raised this issue and the court said, uh, no, that doesn't interest us. And so he was uh, fined to, to, to pay the cost of the lawyer, which by the way is the son of a former director of the uh, legal service of the commission and works in a law firm which uh, assembles the former uh, Advocate General from Germany to the European Court of Justice and the former Secretary General of the Commission and which makes, has, has a slogan, I, I don't recall it word by word now, but our law firm assembles European officials. Yeah, in fact they do that and in fact they seem to deliver good work in the sense of the Commission. So I think uh, that's how I leave you and perhaps you could raise a hand and give me an answer on that question. So who thinks that this system is fair? Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, in this sense, uh, um, most of the cases have turned down uh, of those cases. Are these figures public? So yeah, there, there are some statistics. Okay, so it's on the website. Research them and kind of try to publish them and make at least people aware <coughs> of this, this part of the story. Especially the, I, I don't have it um, now in my mind, but especially the figure of uh, findings of unadmissibility. This, this is really the most relevant figure for me. Right. Yeah, yeah, but it, I mean, when, when you win a case like the one which I won, if you, if you in the end stand, uh, need to pay the costs, um, the maximum amount of the cost, and if yeah. this if this case doesn't give you anything, because in that case my notation was found to be invalid, so in the end I had no notation at all, but I couldn't, as as I explained before, I couldn't force them to give me a new one. I raised a new case case about that and. Uh, that ended very dramatically as well, but that's another story. Thank you. Thank you.